We are now going to hear from Alexandra Simpson, who is a PhD candidate in OSU's College of Engineering. Her coastal and ocean engineering focus has her using different tools and technologies to get a closer look at coastal phenomena, including rip currents, tidal fronts, and more. I don't wanna to steal too much of her thunder. So Alex, looks like you've pulled up your presentation. And so go ahead and start your video and begin your presentation. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I just wanted to echo what Lindsay said to uh, Saskia. That was really interesting. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Alex. I am a PhD student at Oregon State University. Um, I finished my master's degree at OSU about four years ago, uh, and hopefully in about a year, uh, I'll be a doctor. Um, I am what you call a coastal engineer. So this is housed in the field of civil engineering. Um, since I'm not sure many of you have heard of the field of coastal engineering, I'm going to spend um, a few minutes introducing the field and what we do, and then tell you a bit about specifically what I do and how I got to graduate school, hopefully some tips that uh, might help you all if you are also interested in, in pursuing this. Here we go. Um, so a bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego. Um, I went to school at Cornell University and studied something called Earth Systems Engineering, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, later. Um, after college, I had a job as an ocean engineer working at a company in Portland, Maine. Um, then I went to graduate school, got my, my master's degree and hopefully my PhD at OSU. Um, I thought it might be fun to share a couple things about myself. I, I like surfing. You might not be too surprised by that, um, as well as just some generally outdoorsy things. Um, I have a dog named Zena who, I apologize in advance if you hear her barking in the background. Um, she likes to join me for surfing and, and outdoorsy things as well. I love to play board games, um, kind of a nerd. I love to play d and um, also have an affinity for woodworking. And uh, I, I identify primarily as a, as a coastal engineer. So let me tell you a little bit more about coastal engineering. So what is coastal engineering? Uh, the best definition I can give you is that coastal engineers look at the interface between the natural coastal environment and coastal development by humans. So what does this mean? It means we're concerned with how humans interact with the coast and vice versa. Uh, this image in the background of the slide is a pretty fun example. It's a seawall that is protecting a coastal city in England, and you can see it's protecting from some really massive waves. Um, so this would be some, something that a coastal engineer would, would design and build. So as you might guess, um, a big component of what we study is uh, coastal hazards. We study and try to pr uh, protect against coastal hazards. So to name a few of, of the hazards that we're interested in, um, in the upper left, you see a picture from Cannon Beach, Oregon. I know many of you are, are from Oregon. Uh, this is an example of inundation from storm surge. This is a property that is um, being hit with this large storm surge and, and ultimately being flooded. Um, the upper right, we see a, a picture from my hometown, San Diego, where in many cases we see these unstable cliffs. We see these cliffs that are experiencing a lot of erosion and people actually uh, lose their homes due to, due to this erosion. Uh, in the bottom left, we see a picture from New Orleans. This is after Hurricane Katrina. Coastal engineers are concerned with coastal flooding and processes that would lead to that. Um, and then in the bottom right, uh, this is a picture from, oops, Miyako City, Japan. This was after the uh, 2011 tsunami in Japan. The tsunamis are a really big point of interest in our field as well. So we're also interested in coastal development. This is more on the engineering side of the field. Uh, we do things like design breakwaters, uh, ports, um, elements of shoreline protection. You can see this really beautiful port and these breakwaters. Um, in this upper right, upper left panel. Uh, we're also interested in more natural ways to protect the coast. So one example I really like is on the upper left, this is something called a living shoreline. And what this is, is uh, using plants and natural features to protect from flooding, um, to protect from erosion, also to actually improve water quality for fisheries habitats. Another thing that, that uh, coastal engineers are really uh, work a lot on is renewable energy. So renewable energy from the ocean, how can we harness the power of, of the sea for an energy source? This uh, picture I'm showing on the bottom left is uh, the Azuro wave power device in Hawaii. 
And then on, on the bottom right, I'm showing you a project that I'm a really big fan of. Um, this is a beach nourishment project in the Netherlands. So there's a beach that was experiencing a lot of erosion, a lot of losing a lot of sand. And they basically dumped a giant mound of sand uh, on the beach and let it naturally replenish, oops, replenish uh, the beach. This is called the sand motor. On the more science side of the field, uh, we study a really wide variety of coastal processes. Uh, it's important to understand the coastal environment in order to uh, protect against it and build with it. Um, I like this snapshot a lot because it actually shows many of the features um, that we study kind of all in one, <laughs> one frame. If I just talk a little bit about this picture, the first thing that jumps out to me is that we have an estuary environment. Um, this uh, brackish river water dumping out into the ocean. You can also see there are waves along the coast. It's another feature that we, we study a lot. Uh, if you look, look a little closer, you can see some rip currents that are leaving the surf zone. Those, those uh, brown plumes are rip currents that are exiting the surf zone. And then if you look a little closer, even still, um, if you look at those jetties um, coming offshore, if you look at the northern jetty, you can see that there's a lot more sand that's accumulated on the northern side. This is called accretion. Uh, on, the, on the southern jetty, um, there's erosion happening. We're losing sand down there. Um, so there's a number of ways to study the coastal environment. We can put sensors in the water to measure velocity, temperature, salinity. Uh, we can also take boats out into the water to measure the same processes. But the way that I study the coast is a little bit different. I use something called remote sensing where I look at the water from above. Um, so I, I use cameras, um, radars, which I'll tell you about. This has its advantage because sometimes environments are too harsh for sensors and boats. Um, sometimes the sensors are too expensive, or sometimes the areas that we study are quite remote and it's difficult to actually get in the water. So one example of remote sensing that I do is to use drones. Um, now you might recognize this drone, it's called the DJI Phantom 4 Pro. It's just available off the shelf. Uh, it's relatively low cost as far as scientific equipment goes, but it allows me to take videos and snapshots of the coast and then determine quantitative things about the coast from those videos. Um, this picture in the background is one that I've taken of a rip current uh, down in central California. I'm currently working on a paper that utilizes uh, drone observations. The title of the paper is at the top, but I'll just explain it to you. Um, this image shows a place in Connecticut where fresh river water on the top of the screen is meeting salty ocean water at the bottom of the screen. So the lighter water is the river water, the dark, the, sorry, the light, lighter water is the ocean water, the darker water is the river water. And what happens when these two masses of waters meet is pretty interesting. This is a video I'll go ahead and play for you. You see at the boundary, there's all these swirling features. These are called instabilities, um, also called vortices. And you, I'll play the video again. This is a boat that is actually in the water sampling. Um, but you can see that when I look at the water from above, I can get a vast amount of information. Um, I can measure things like the wavelengths of these instabilities, how long they are, how fast they're moving. And so that's the premise of, of this paper is to understand um, this, uh, what might seem like a small feature of swirling water, but something that's actually uh, pretty important in, in the um, mixing of the estuary region. Another way that I study the coast using remote sensing is using a tool called a radar. Um, so in the left, you can see me sitting in front of one of our radars. Uh, the background of this slide shows our radar tower. We have this um, 100 foot tower that looks out over the coast. And these radars are exactly like what you find on a sailboat, except on a sailboat, you would be using the radars to look out for other boats and you'd actually not want to be seeing too much clutter on the surface, right? You want to um, remove all the, the sea clutter and just enhance the boats. Um, but we're interested in the opposite, right? So we want to actually look at the sea surface using these radars. And we can actually get really nice signatures of a variety of things. I'll show you some examples of radar movies. So on the left, this is a radar that we have in Newport, Oregon. You can see the coastline. Um, you can see the jetties in Newport. And when I play this movie, you'll see that uh, a bunch of uh, waves coming to shore. 
that we can image in the radar. On the left, um, this is actually the, the field site that we have in Connecticut that I already mentioned. Um, in, in this left video, um, what I'm showing you is an average of a number of frames of the radar. So we're actually averaging out the waves. And what you can see is longer features. So we start to be able to see things that move slower um, when we move the signature of the waves. So I'll play this for you. These lines are all fronts. So these are locations where different salinity water masses are meeting um, and interacting in interesting ways. So this uh, front that you see, this line, is actually the same front that I showed you in the demo footage. Um, but here I'm looking at it over a scale of a couple kilometers, whereas before I was looking at it over a scale of about 100 meters. So I'm currently working on a, a paper um, using radar. Um, I'm looking at something called internal waves. This is a study that we did down in Central California. Um, sometimes when you look out at the coast, you see these, uh, you can imagine looking out at the water and you see streaks in the water, um, like lighter colored streaks or darker colored streaks. These are often internal waves. And what an internal wave is, is it's a wave that exists uh, in the water column as opposed to on the surface. So it's kind of like if you picture oil and water um, at the boundary between the oil and water, you can imagine there's some wiggling going on. These are internal waves. Um, and what I'm doing is using the radar, I'll show you this movie on the left, um, to estimate how fast these waves are moving, which is pretty difficult to do using boats or moorings alone. Um, but this radar gives us a snapshot of the entire coast, uh, we can see these, these features coming to shore. OK, so I'll take a step back. I want to talk a little bit about uh, being a coastal engineer. Um, I absolutely love doing this work. I love uh, playing with drones. I love playing with radars. Um, but I sort of found this uh, job accidentally. I definitely wasn't sitting in high school thinking, I want to be a coastal engineer, because honestly, I had no idea what a, what a coastal engineer was. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about my story of how I ended up here. So I, before high school, um, wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, I think that's pretty common as a kid. Um, I had a lot of pets. I volunteered at the Humane Society. But in sort of a classic discovery, I guess, I realized I don't like needles. This wasn't the job for me. Um, in high school, I did some volunteering at uh, the zoo. This was at the San Diego Zoo. Um, and my job was in the, my volunteer position was in the education department. Um, so I would talk to the public at the zoo about things like conservation, um, protecting the environment. Sometimes they had me dress up like Monty the meerkat. Um, and I kind of thought for a while, okay, maybe I want to be a zookeeper. Um, well, I went away to college. I went to, I was accepted to Cornell University. And I kind of want to take a moment to say that I think that um, the volunteer experiences that I did in, in high school was kind of a, a really major component of, of why I was accepted um, accepted into university. So kind of just a plug for, for doing any volunteering work that you can get your hands on in high school. Um, so I went to Cornell. My uh, family encouraged me to study engineering. Um, I started studying mechanical engineering, but I wasn't really interested in design work. Um, so I decided that wasn't for me. Then I tried out chemical engineering. Um, I didn't really like chemistry, so that wasn't going to work. Um, then I tried out civil and environmental engineering, but again, I wasn't that interested in building things. So I found this program called Science of Earth Systems Engineering. Um, and the big draw for me here was that I was able to spend two semesters doing field classes. I spent a term in Hawaii studying uh, various aspects of the Hawaiian Islands. This is a picture of me picking up some lava. Um, and then I also had the opportunity to do a C semester. So this is a, a pretty well-known program. Um, I would encourage everyone to keep their eye on if they're able to in college. Um, basically, you spend a couple of weeks learning how to sail. Um, during this trip, uh, we had to do a, a class project um, involving something involving the ocean. And I decided to do my class project on wave energy. I was interested to find out if you could estimate how much energy there is in the ocean that you can extract. So I did this little class project. Um, and actually, weirdly enough, this led me to my first job. Um, so I, I got a, a job with this company in Maine called Ocean Renewable Power Company. They harness tidal energy 
in the Bay of Fundy, which has really, really large tides. Um, I was an engineer for them, but I also did things like environmental protection, looking at the environmental impact of the turbine. Um, and I really loved working for this company, but I decided I wanted to learn more about renewable energy um, and also lean a little bit more in the science direction. So I applied to some grad schools and was accepted at OSU. Um, my master's work, I did studying wave energy. Um, I did a project involving that, but then my advisor was, was just starting to, to do some stuff with drones, just starting to play around with them. And I was like, dang, that sounds fun. I would love to, to fly a drone. So my interest kind of moved more over into this, this realm of remote sensing. Um, and I decided that was what I really like to do. So that is what I'm finishing my PhD in. And um, I plan to continue uh, doing coastal engineering with this emphasis on remote sensing. So looking at the, the coast, looking at the water from above, um, and that's what I plan to do when I when I finish my degree. So that's kind of my story. I will wrap up here. I think it's been about 15 minutes um, and open up for any questions that folks have. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for your fantastic presentation. Um, participants, go ahead and submit questions through the Q&A function. We can get to as many questions as we can before we log off for today. Um, and so question for you, Alex, is are you, like, are there, are there skill sets that you have, like, that you would recommend for students to think about different experiences so they can gain skills so they could be, so they can work in something like coastal engineering or engineering in general, or just skills that are really key to a future in engineering in general. So feel free to, that was multiple questions, so. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. One of the first things that comes to mind is, I think when I was um, in high school and in college, I think there was this idea that math was really scary. Um, and, you know, it, I just want to emphasize that, like, math, math is not that scary. <laughs> um, I think that it kind of gets this, this, this bad app, um, but it, it is, has been kind of a beautiful thing for me to um, study a mathematically based field and, and realize that you can use um, numbers and equations to describe the world around you. Um, so I, I kind of just wanted to say, like, um, you know, <laughs> paying attention in, in math class <laughs> was, you know, I don't think I retained very much in high school, but then you move forward and you realize, hey, actually, that stuff was kind of interesting and kind of useful. Um, other skills, though, I mean, just little things like doing field work. Um, I realized that like, you know, random things that I learned about the natural environment growing up um, ended up kind of coming back to be interesting to me. Like, um, I feel like I was very fortunate to spend time at the beach as a kid. I realized like um, having kind of a feel for, for waves and for the ocean um, ended up you know, kind of paying off in the long run. Um, other skills, I think, uh, talking about science, and this kind of kind of gets back to Saskia's presentation as well. Like, uh, in terms of communicating interests, talking about science, I think that's a huge, huge piece of of science and engineering. Um, being able to to communicate about what it is you're doing and what it is you're thinking about. So even just having conversations with your friends about um, something interesting you see in, in nature and um, just kind of practicing talking about it and, and not being afraid to say something wrong because we all say things wrong all the time. Um, I guess those are kind of three three things I would, would mention. I'm sure we could go on for a while. So thank you for giving us your top three. That's great, Alex. Thank you. Um, so what methods do you use to collect data other than GIS and mapping? This is a question from Nathan. Yeah, Nathan. Um, so I, the things I've mentioned, I use the drone um, to collect data. So I fly the drone out, take some, some um, images and movies. Um, I use the radar. I also um, really enjoy the synthesis between taking these images of the water and then actually taking measurements in the water. So if you imagine I have like a wave buoy in the water and then I'm looking at the water from above, you can connect the two what you're seeing. You can get different pieces of information from the water 
um, by being in it as opposed to being above it. So I think um, having that kind of uh, connection between the two. Other, other things in, in the world of remote sensing though, I mean, a big piece is using satellites. Um, I will often download satellite data to look at various things. Um, also in the last project I did, there was a big component of airplanes. So people put uh, cameras and various sensors on airplanes and then flew over the coast and, and gathered data that way. There's a handful of things. Great, Alex. There seems to be a gray box on your screen. So we just stopped your screen share and now I can see your face. Oh, <laughs> you're good. So another quick question. Um, for, so what is the most difficult part of coastal engineering and how do you overcome it? Ooh, so, no, most difficult. Take a second. <laughs> um, okay, well, I can come at this from a number, number of angles. I guess I'll start with um, collecting data in the ocean is difficult. Someone once told me that, um, don't, you know, don't, don't quote me on this, but that designing, um, designing for space is actually potentially easier than designing for putting things in the ocean because all, all the forces in the ocean, like there's salty water, there's waves, there's intense currents, um, always just want to mess with your instruments. Um, so I think a big challenge is getting um, meaningful data. Um, so, you know, not to advocate too strongly for, for remote sensing, but I think it's pretty, pretty neat when you can get rich information from, um, you know, flying a, a pretty inexpensive drone. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's great, Alex. Thank you so much. And thank you participants for all your great questions. We really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So thank you, Alex, very much for your time and uh, for giving us some insight into your coastal engineering work.